Hi, I'm Jeffrey Shaw. I'm a business coach for self-employed business owners, the host of the Self-Employed Life podcast and author of two business books, Lingo and The Self-Employed Life. The best advice I ever received is also the most disturbing advice I ever received, which is or was no one will care about your life as much as you do. That's good advice, but yet that's disturbing as hell. It's, so it is disturbing. Wow. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> Even more I'll, disturbing I'll is the source, but I'll leave it up to you to ask the questions. Oh, there we go. Cool. Well, let, <laughs> we'll get back to that, right? Because I think that that is interesting. But mm -hmm. first, I have to ask, and you make this really clear in the book, but I think it's an important distinction. Why self-employed and not freelance or solopreneur or entrepreneur or small business owner? Why is self-employed such an important word for yeah. you? Uh, I so appreciate, Phil, you asking that question because I so appreciate how much attention that's gotten in the book because I actually thought that was going to be a throwaway. It was actually much, much further into the book, like an ending chapter, uh, until after the advanced readers. And it was so highlighted, we moved it right up front. So I'm so glad people want to know the difference, right? Because that's the beginning of taking ownership of it. The reason it's important is just for that reason. Like We need to take ownership of the term self-employed. Uh, by and large, people don't use the term. And I know that because I did, a, I relaunched my website last year. I did a lot of keyword research, hired professionals to, to, uh, you know, to look into the searchability of the website and found that, that my audience, self-employed business owners, the people that I coach every day, don't search for support using the term self-employed. In fact, Phil, when I had the idea to write this book, The Self-Employed Life, I did my due diligence. I went to Amazon. I searched for books in the category of self-employed and found that the top 10 books under those keywords were about taxes. How to pay taxes when you're self-employed. I mean, boring, boring stuff. What was even more disturbing is that it was the first time in 36 years I even looked to see if there was a book out there to help self-employed people. Right. Even more shocking. It's like, why did it never occur to me to even ch ever check to see if there was a book that would help me as a self-employed business owner? And that's why we need to take ownership of the term so that we realize we're not in. We, as I say in my podcast, we may be in business for ourselves, but we're not in business by ourselves. We need to bond together as a community so that we can support one another. We need to make sure we get fair representation from our governments. Right. Which I believe because of massive force that we have such a big impact on the economy that I believe that we are going to, we need to be separated from the big bucket of small business because the small business is too broad of a category. Energetically, I, I, you know, I want people to take ownership of the term so that they're not calling themselves solopreneurs because none of us should think of ourselves as being solo. Entrepreneur, sexy term, I get it but it doesn't describe the business model. It, it, it Nowadays, entrepreneur sounds like you're in between jobs and a hustle, and it just doesn't really give anybody some val valid information as to who you are and what you do. So it's a big part of the mission of the book is to really get the term self-employed to be used much more. Wow, the great answer. And I really do love that because I've thought for a long time that there's got to be something better than solopreneur or freelance. I mean, Dan Pink wrote Free Agent Nation, which meant we're going to move around. And then we picked up freelance. I remember there was some websites around that, but self-employed totally makes the most sense because it could be me and an assistant. It could be me and a designer. It could be me and a team of other self-employed folks, but it doesn't have to be just me, but I'm the one that pays my own bills. I'm the one that pays Correct. those bills. And I, I, I love that distinction. I think that's super important, but you talk about this ecosystem. I think it's really important that as we're kind of framing this up here, folks understand the ecosystem. You said there's three stools here, three legs, if you will, of this uh, self-employed ecosystem. You say personal development, business strategies, and daily habits, which is how your book's broken down, which is super helpful. So let's let's step through those. Let's start with personal development, Jeffrey. Why is personal development so important to you and to those of us that are self-employed? Yeah, you know, it's uh, at the end of the day, it's, your level of success when you're self-employed and by the way it's no mistake i don't believe that the term self-employed begins with self right because actually your success when you're self-employed is contingent or relative to your personal development so in order for your business to grow 
in order for you to go to the proverbial next level in your business, it can't always be that you work harder. It can't always be you apply more action because truth of the matter is you're probably working as hard as you can. But there's at some point where you, you, you hit the proverbial ceiling, like you can only put in so many hours. And the whole point of being self-employed was to live the life that you want to live. So just filling that up with hours and hard work and hustle isn't actually accomplishing the dream of the self-employed life that you hope for. So I look at personal development as the way to build your capacity. And capacity is the key word here. So when you want more success in your business, you have to work on your own inner capacity. Chances are you have to step out of some ways in which you are limiting your thinking. You likely have to, uh, which I think is, this is the biggest challenge I think for most people, you have to step into what you really deserve and not what you currently believe you deserve. Okay. You have to start thinking bigger. You have to believe that you're capable of more. You have to see more in yourself than maybe your current state of how much you see in yourself. All of that is ways of increasing the capacity because your mindset has to expand before you put in more action and more effort than you're currently doing. Otherwise, it's like trying to fit more in a limited container. So you have to Expand on the inside first, apply the action. The symptom of when, you know, and I, as I often say, it, if you feel like you're working really hard, but hardly getting ahead, or you feel like you just can't fit any more in, that is a sim symptom and a sign that you're putting in more effort than you are mentally prepared and personally developed prepared to receive. That's so interesting. That's so interesting. I, I've not, I didn't consider that until I read your book. Yeah. And then I re read this and I'm like, oh, wow, like that completely makes sense. Often it's because we're afraid to give something up. Mm -hmm. We're afraid to share. Right. We do feel so low and we have to expand our mind to recognize that it really is together, even though together might not be with an employee or a or a hired on team. So I, I really I really dig that, Jeffrey. That's a that's an awesome point. So personal development makes so much sense. Stepping into what we really deserve, not just what we think we deserve is great. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go on to step two here, or part two, I guess, not step two necessarily, although I probably would say it is step two based on what you just said, and that is business strategies. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about some of those business strategies and the business places that we need to be in, and maybe not be. Yeah, you know, and, and it's definitely the meatiest part of the book because, you know, we love the work, and I, I'm I'm every bit as much, I love applying strategy. I love being in an act in action. So that is the meatiest part of the book. The difference is the strategies I offer in the book, I believe are really unusual and really innovative. And what's most important is they're right sized. You know, we live in a world, we as self-employed business owners are doing business in a world that the businesses around us are likely a lot larger than ours. And they're likely more transactionally based than our businesses are. When you're self-employed, whether it's products or services, you're, you're, in a, you're more likely to be in a relationship-based business. The relationship with those that you serve is likely critically important for loyalty, repeat customers, and referrals. So when you are in a relationally-based business as opposed to a transactional-based business, Almost everything the rest of the world being transactionally based has to be flipped upside down. And that's what I mean by right-sized business strategies. One of the strategies I talk about in the book is what I call hug marketing. Hug marketing is an absolute flip it upside down, turn it around concept that we normally think of as a marketing funnel. Okay, But I, I flip it upside down and say the goal when you're self-employed can in a relationship based business cannot be being broad and wide open at the top only to squeeze your customers through the small opening at the bottom, like which is what the typical visual of a funnel is. It has to be looked at as a series of concentric circles where the responsibility is up to the business to bring people from the outer circles to the inner circle, the inner one most being the, the hug of marketing. So, there's so many strategies in the book. Like I said, it is by far the business strategies of the media section, because, you know, speaking of the ecosystem, let's, let's address this. 
like any ecosystem in nature, it is not about it's not about what creates an, a thriving. I don't. I hesitate to even say the word balance, but what creates a thriving ecosystem is that all the pieces are working, but all the pieces are not working in the same proportion. Okay, same thing with our human bodies, right? Our, hu our human bodies are what sixty to seventy percent water, right? Far more than the actual organs, and yet the the heart, being a pretty small organ, is critical to actually living. So a thriving ecosystem is that all the pieces are working, but not necessarily in the same proportion. The same is true as the, of the self-employed ecosystem. Chances are most of your time and effort is going to be put into action. It's going to be marketing strategies and the, the, the business strategies. But you don't have a thriving and healthy ecosystem if you're leaving out the other two parts of personal development and daily habits, which I'm sure you're going to get into in a moment. So it's not about equal. It's about everything working so that you have a thriving ecosystem. Absolutely. I, hug marketing was going to be the next thing that I was going to talk about and go deeper on that because that is that was one of the, the biggest eye openers for me when I read the book. And because I, I, I hate the funnel. Right. I, I, I don't yeah. like that. Right. I, I'm not. I mean, I, I, even if I love you, I'm not going to squeeze the life out of you, which is what a funnel yeah. does. I mean, that's it's so darn painful in there. So uh, before we jump to the next piece here, Jeffrey, let's go a little deeper into hug marketing yeah. and why a traditional funnel is really such a I mean, it's just even mindset wise. <laughs> yeah. It's such a mind screw to us as as a yeah. marketer, because I got to tell you that that just seems like a recipe for failure, not success. Yeah. Well, keeping in mind, my previous book was called Lingo, right? So Lingo in and of itself, the book is about it's a brand. It's a brand messaging strategy to attract your ideal customers. But if you strip that back even further, it's about the energy of words. Right? And that's what I'm focused on here. I just I pay close attention to the energy of words, not only because of how they're interpreted to other people. Right, because how you say something, you can say something very differently. One of my favorite Southern phrases is, um, you know, bless her heart. You know, it's how it's said <laughs> that has the most impact. But that's not even the, I think, yes, that's important. But I think maybe even the most important part, the reason you want to pay attention to the words and the terms that you use is how it sets up your mindset. Because when you're self-employed, what you internalize comes out. And if you think of your customers as a target audience, if you think of them as a target, if you think of them as the with the energy of a marketing funnel where you're loving and open minded at the top, but you squeeze them through a hole. If you if you are internalizing these things by using typical marketing terms, that's exactly the energy by which people are going to receive it. And we can't afford that when we're self-employed because we need every customer to matter. We, you know, we go into business for ourselves, again, the smallest of businesses wanting to actually have direct impact with the people whose lives we want to change, whether it's with a service or a product, right? We want to have direct impact on some people's lives. The problem is we have to untrain ourselves from the bad energy of a lot of typical terms that are used in business, because I, I just don't know how you can look at your customers as a target audience and energetically them not feel like they're being targeted. Right. So, for example, in my business, we don't even use the word marketing because that is always followed up by marketing to or marketing at. You were always marketing at somebody or marketing to an audience. What I liked, would I flip it upside down and I use the term enrolling. Right. So we I don't have a marketing plan in my business. I have an enrolling plan. What is my plan to energetically enroll people into my business? The goal is the same. The goal is to gain clients. That's the practical reality of being in business. But energetically, how you go, I feel a lot better about how who I am as a person and how I feel like I treat my prospective customers when I think about it's my job to compel them and enroll them into hiring me, not that they're a target. So that's why the premise of hug marketing just so beautifully represents this because it's not about a funnel. It's not about a target audience fitting to a funnel. It is a series of concentric circles, right? So for the outermost circle are lurkers, right? Those are your lurkers are people that are following in social media and you don't even know they're there. They're the listeners of our podcast that we don't know by name, but they're there and they're lurking until which point 
they become curious enough to step in a little bit closer, which is the next concentric circle, at which point they might actually start engaging and interacting with our social media posts, the things they're posting. And then the ultimate goal is then hopefully they become connected. They're likely to become connected by opting into some free value that you offer. From there, the goal is what? From connected, we're hoping to make them a customer. But even still, we don't stop there. The end goal in hug marketing is not to just gain the customer. The goal is one more step, which is when they become the customer that you can't imagine seeing in person and not giving them a hug because you've built that level of a relationship with them because they're the ones that are going to keep coming back and they're the ones that are going to send you referrals. So it's energetically such a different process when you take responsibility for bringing people from the outermost rings of, of the concentric circles to towards the middle. That visual is so good and so powerful, and the energy behind that just makes so much darn sense, Jeffrey. I, I really, out of all the stuff in the book, that was the thing that resonated the most for me because that's one of the reasons why I do my podcast, right? I want to. I mean, we talked about this in the green room, right? I mean, we've been dancing around each other for years. Yeah. yeah. Finally, we get a chance to spend some time together, right? And now, yeah. I mean, it's funny because you know neither one of us are probably going to you know work with each other like as employees but certainly there's opportunity there to collaborate but until we get close enough to actually collide and hug if you will virtually or in person now we can't you know there, there's nothing there so i really really dig that yeah. man that's and, really good and i want to point out the reason that resonates for you is because you're that person like, I can't wait to see you in person and we're past all this and I, you, you know, I could give each other a hug because I got news. You must give a hell of a hug. I mean, you just seem like a bear hug kind of guy, right? Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah, I can see that that's the hug. That's the hug I want. And that's why hug marketing resonates for you. The reality is most people that go into business for themselves are like us. Most people that go into business for themselves are not hard ass, crass, don't give a, don't give a crap about people. That, that's not who self-employed people are. Self-employed people, I believe self-employed people have been craving a way to do in business that's aligned with their heart. And it and we, we go into business and feel like we have to just deal with the way business is done until we find out things like hug marketing and the things that I teach, which is you can be in business and you need to be in business. I actually think the world is craving doing business with people like us now. Right, so this is a way of being in business. Ever. I think it feels natural for self-employed business owners. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, well, now more than ever because a hug offers you the chance to pause, to listen, and to offer a little bit of humanity yeah. in a world that often feels really, really tough. I mean, yeah. and really lonely. I mean, freelancing, uh, feel just by by design. It's like, well, I'm, I did a job and now I'm done and there's nothing left. I don't, I feel like, you know, I, that's the gig economy and I'm not in, I'll tell you right now, Jeffrey, I have no interest in that, but I certainly have interest in being self-employed. And that's yeah. so interesting that you talk about that. Um, before we get into daily habits, uh, I, I want to pop in because you asked that you answer this beautifully in the book about this group here, but Jennifer Leak wants to know, what do you think about NACE, right? The National Association of Self-Employed. So talk to us a little bit about that. And then we're going to move into daily yeah. habits. Oh my gosh. Here's, so I've interviewed Keith Hall, the CEO, um, for, on my podcast. And also, uh, I did a video interview with Katie Valestra, who is, uh, NACE's, uh, liaison to Washington, DC. I want her job. Um, actually, I don't want a job because I don't want to be, I want to be self-employed, but I do want to be politically a lot more involved, um, which is why I look at myself more as of an advocate as a leader, uh, because I really would like to get more involved in the politics to protect self-employed business owners. How I feel about this, here's the thing that really stood out to me. When I interviewed Keith Hall, I'd said to him, and this was just last year, and I said to Keith, how is it I've been in business, self-employed for 36 years, and I'm just now finding out about this organization? Like, love you all. You're doing a great job, but you're one of the most the most poorest marketed organizations out there. Like, how is it I've been self-employed for 36 years and didn't even know it existed? That's a problem. Like, I wish they did a better job, and that's why I talk about them a lot in the book, and I offer them as a resource. Um, you know, I think, first of all, I think one thing that they do really effectively is I think it's important for self-employed business owners to realize they're part of an industry. Again, inherently, when we become self-employed, we're very independent-minded. 
and we don't realize that we're actually a part of an industry. So for example, I, in my career, I'm a professional photographer, professional speaker, podcaster. So I belong to my trade associations. I belong to the National Speakers Association and I belong to the Professional Photographers of America. So I belong to my trade associations. It never occurred to me that there was a trade association for self-employed business owners. And that's actually what NACE is. And I think that's incredibly important. So I highly encourage people to, to, to join, to be in support of the idea that there is an organization representing us. I do know that they are they're do, they do a really good job at standing up and being an advocate for self-employed business owners in Washington, DC. Um, and I think there's some really good work for them to do there in the future. I mean, I'm, I can't say I'm aligned with all their political views, um, but overall, I think they're a really excellent organization and doing some really good work. And I, I do stand behind their mission a great deal. Cool. Yeah. NACE.org, N-A-S-E.org is where you can find them. Jeffrey talks about these a lot in his fantastic book, The Self-Employed Life, which I love. So, Jeffrey, we're going to talk about daily habits. And I think this dovetails nicely into a question that Jay Cunnington asks. He says, how can it, meaning business, life, whatever, be a roller coaster? Not every day can be a good day. And and yeah. sure, absolutely, that's true. But we can make it a smoother roller coaster. So talk to us uh, how we do that with our daily yeah. habits, Jeffrey, because I think that's a great tie-in. Yeah, 100%, Jay. In fact, I, I'm a big fan of saying, you know, phew, that was a rough hour because <laughs> the next hour might be entirely different. That's the reality. Like, it isn't just a daily roller coaster. It's an hourly roller coaster. Um, you know, it's it's a Monday that, that we're having this conversation. And um, I actually plan on doing a, a podcast myself about this because one of the ways I solve that is I used to create for myself, money Mondays, I used to call them. So it was, I only pay bills on Mondays. Um, I actually started it because of my kids. When I was raising my three kids between, and I was divorced, between the three of them, somebody was always asking for me, asking me for money all week long. And I decided that was too much of a roller coaster. It was too discouraging. I'd make a dollar and $5 would go out, you know? So I decided that I just wanted to make, in a practical way, just make Mondays the day I dealt with money. Now that's kind of transitioned into like Mondays is my day that I devote to moving my business forward. These are the days I follow up on leads, et cetera. So there are practical things you can do to even out that, that roller coaster, but it does dovetail perfectly into the point of daily habits. Daily, here's the key, daily habits create consistent mindsets. It's the sustainability piece of the subtitle of, of my book, which is uh, business and personal development strategies that create sustainable success. The daily habits is the sustainability piece. It's also the piece that almost everyone is missing. I have um, a self-employed assessment that, that I offer. We can talk about that in a moment. Also, when I begin my coaching clients, we go through that assessment. I also ask them to rate themselves on several categories and almost always, People are weakest on the category of daily habits. And yet they also know that if they had more consistent daily habits, that they might feel better on a daily basis. But the key is, is that it's daily habits to create uh, consistent mindsets because the consistent mindsets help you not get derailed, right? That's, that's the consistency piece. Um, however, I will say I'm a huge proponent, as I was saying earlier, it's not an equal form. What I'm speaking of are daily habits that you can do in 15 to 20 minutes a day. Okay. And I'm very focused on that because I am a hyper time efficient person. That's just who I am. But I believe that's true of all self-employed people. We don't have to, the, what's going to derail them from maintaining their daily habits. Is it being a daunting task? Okay. So what we have to find out, which is what I teach in the book are specific daily habits that both in you know in experience and in science we can validate that they work so that you know as a business owner that the effort you put in is going to pay off and we can talk about some of those daily habits specifically if you want but that to me is a key component is that a you need them for consistency and b it can't be a daunting task or you're not going to stick with it and sticking with it is the point
No, I, I absolutely right. 15 minutes or less stuff we can actually do stuff that works. Absolutely. So let's talk about a couple of daily habits, Jeffrey. Yeah. Give me one that you love the most. And then and then I'll ask some questions and maybe we'll go into one more if we have time. Yeah. So the one I love the most, it, which is it's the only content that's in both my books, but I mean, something's so good. I mean, and it's just part of my life. Like it would be irresponsible for me to not include it in my second book. And it's what I call a what's going right journal. It's a game changer. It's a game. It has been proven to be a game changer for me and, and, and my clients. So it's the what's going right journal. It is, you could say similar to a gratitude journal, but it's different. And the reason I changed it up is quite frankly, Phil, I, I just did not find that gratitude journals worked for me. They weren't tangible enough. I, I think gratitude is a fantastic value, fantastic life value. I live in gratitude and that's kind of the problem. If I wake up and the sun is shining and I'm breathing and my dog is still with me, I'm pretty grateful. I just don't know what to do with that level. I mean, gratitude makes you, like I said, it's, it's a great life value. I think we should all live in gratitude. But I want, chances are, I'm very focused, as I am almost every day, on my business growing. So I want tangible results. So what I did is I created the What's Going Right Journal. And to be honest with you, I created it one, uh, during a very difficult time for myself uh, because I became very aware of how our human brain works. We are wired for survival. And because of that, we always see the negative first, right? We see our threats. And hey, our threats may not be lions and tigers and bears outside of our cave, but our threats are how we feel about ourselves, our self-esteem, a, a blow to our self-esteem. Our threats are how we compare ourselves to other people on social media. Our threats are all the things we put ourselves through every day that make us feel less good about ourselves. That's an everyday threat. Every day we live with the threat that we're not going to feel as good with us or we're banking on something happening that's going to make us feel better about ourselves. But that's a weak foundation. Okay, so what I started this What's Going Right journal is because the more you recognize what's going right, what we know, it's proven by science, is what you focus on, you get more of. And it literally starts to rewire the brain from the brain's natural tendency to always see the negative always to see the one insult amongst nine compliments. When you start focusing on what's going right. And like I said, I started it during the most, one of my most challenging times in life when it was hard to see anything going right. A lot was going wrong, but I pounded away at it and like, what's going right? What's going right? What's going right? And no matter what the circumstances are, you can always find things that are going right in your life. And those little things going right start becoming bigger things and then bigger things and then even bigger things. And that's how you can reverse the tendency to be drawn to the negative and start seeing and start. That's where the gratitude marries with it so well, because you start getting grateful for all the littlest of things that are going right, as well as the big things. But you suddenly start feeling more grateful because what's going right is somebody's introducing you to people. You know, as a, as a fellow speaker, I'm so appreciative when a speaker introduces me to an event planner for a, a potential speaking gig, right? So now I'm going to journal that. Like what's going right is somebody took time out of their life to make an introduction. So there's gratitude tucked in. But I, so what I do is I journal for five to seven minutes every morning. Every sentence begins with what's going right is. What's going right is I'm meeting awesome people. What's going right is my book launch was really successful. What's going right is on and on and on until I just feel like I've drained myself. Uh, and then, you know, for me, for me, this is a morning practice. How can you not go about the rest of the day not seeing what's going right? You can't, you can't avoid it. You can't unsee it. Yeah, well, it definitely helps us shift our focus, shift our energy, because frankly, you know, as as Jay mentioned here, right, it, every day may not be a good day, but there is something, something, hopefully for most of us, right, that is going right. And, you know, cortisol levels go up and stress us out when we're always in threat mode, right? I don't want to be more yeah. threat. I want to be more at peace. I want to flow. I want to do the right stuff here because frankly, I want my decisions to matter. I, you know, if I'm going to, you know, that whole hug marketing thing, I mean, if, if I'm going to send you good energy, right. Uh, there's nothing worse as a salesperson than commission breath. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I got to make this sale or I'm not going to be able to pay the mortgage this month. Yeah. And it's the 30th of the month. Holy crap. Right. So slow down friends. If you're listening here, 
we'll start with what's going right is, as yeah. Jeffrey suggests here, and discover what's going right yeah. instead of focusing on what's going wrong. Yeah. And during the most challenging times, what's going right is that you're showing up for yourself and doing the practice. And that's worth noting too, you know, if because that's sending something to yourself. You know, I, I, I said to somebody recently on, on social media, because people were asking questions about the challenge of com com comparison, you know, um, and actually what it was is somebody had asked a whole group of people to, to quiet down about how well they were doing during the pandemic, because not everybody's doing so well. And I just spoke up and said, first of all, I think it's unfair to ask people who are thriving during a difficult time to, to quiet down. A, maybe they can help lift other people up. And B, I think it's, it's an opportunity for training ourselves. In order, when, if things aren't going so well for you and people around you are thriving and things are going good for them, what you have to tap into within yourself to, to still show up happy for other people is exactly the mindset and skill that will make you the next person rising to the top. Okay. So it's digging. So if, if, if you have to acknowledge nothing more than you showing up for yourself, if you have to acknowledge nothing more than the fact that you're, you are happy, genuinely happy for other people, even though things aren't going so good for you, that's exactly what you need to be doing to turn it around. Yeah. Wow. Good stuff. Good stuff. So give us one more daily habit here, Jeffrey. I've got a couple more questions here to ask you, but give me one more good daily habit that we can practice. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm going to throw a, a freebie in there, meditation, right? So some sort of clearing the mind. I, I meditate, but it could be running, it could be walking. I think we all need some kind of what I call clearing of the mind practice uh, to, to just slow it down. But the one that I think has more a tangible result is uh, how to to set your intentions. Okay, so I offer in the book a very specific structure on how to set intentions so that they're not vague and just kind of hanging out there, but rather to really get clear on what you want to go from and what you want to go to. Okay, so you want to go from, you know, some sort of struggle to the freedom of that struggle, but call it out. And it has to be a single sentence and a from to format. Like I want to go from, you know, not having enough money to meet my bills to having more than enough money. Okay, from two very effective when it comes to setting intentions and then of course affirming those intentions by by playing them over and over again in your head so i'm very um i actually do um part of my practice on mondays which again i used to refer to as money mondays i still call them money mondays but it's not so much about paying bills now it's about moving the business forward but i do um every week an intention evaluation where I'm very clear on the intentional outcomes I want from action steps I'm taking. Like when I was doing my book launch, I was very clear on what's the intention. I did a, a two day summit. There was the book launch. Uh, I've, I try to be very clear and I'll write it out. Like what's my intention in taking this action. And while that action is in place every Monday, I have a summary of all my current intentions. And every Monday I, I just do an intention evaluation just to kind of step into whole, am I holding the intention of what I want to go from and what I want to go to? Uh, so again, very specific, not time consuming action for what I think is a very big life changing result. Yeah, well, specificity helps us move forward. I think yeah. a lot of times we are vague as as self-employed folks. We we get so caught up in the big picture yeah. that we forget about the little picture and we end up uh, running the wrong direction or just running. And then we're like, well, I missed step three, four and five. And therefore, I don't have this. So talk to me a little bit about systems, Jeffrey, because I, I find that systems are where a lot of self-employed folks fall down, whether they're a sales system, a marketing system or even just a business system for getting paid. Yeah, and I think I would suggest that there's two ways of looking at systems, right? There's the practical systems, right? So CRMs, online schedulers, I'm all for all that. And I and I, we also want to, we want as many things as possible to be systematic and to be automated. Uh, my suggestion there is to choose systems, particularly technology for the business to come, not for the business you currently have. Again, I think there's a real energy to that. If you're making a decision on, be it a software like a CRM, um, you know, 
don't choose the cheapest, lowest package because that's what all your business needs now. Step it up at least a notch so that you can hold the energy and space that you have a system for the business to come. Because I think, and again, you also just want to be prepared. It's really hard to catch up. I also, I coach a lot of uh, people transitioning from corporate life to self-employed life. You know, people that have been in uh, the corporate world and they want to do more purposeful work, start their own business. And I coach a lot of people in that transitional practice. And uh, if they're able to, they'll have a good six months to a year runway where they're still, they still have the steady paycheck and we're building out their business. One of the things we work on the most are their systems, right? Because when they have the freedom from the nine to five, we don't want them, their brain focused on setting up systems. We want them their What they need at that point is to be stay focused on getting the work. Okay. So um, there's a logical way of system. I think the other, the other way I talk about systems in the book are ways in ways people don't think about. One of the systems, if you will, that I talk about is to strive to be bored. Like we don't think of that as a system, but it's very much a system. And what I mean by that is because there's so many demands on our self-employed businesses, we want to strive to be bored. What can you delegate? What can you automate? What can you get rid of? Right? The reason is that you want to create space for business expansion. Business expansion can't happen when it's already full. And, and I'll prove this to you. It's amazing to me how many clients reach out to me for to gain my support as their coach to help their business grow. And yet in the beginning, every call, every phone call that we're getting on, they're expressing that they're overwhelmed. They're feeling stressed out. Uh, maybe they haven't gone to the work that we're working on. They haven't gotten around to it because so many other things came up. And at some point, I'll have to point out to them, do you see the irony here? You've hired me. You've invested in my services to expand your business, but you're also acting like you don't have room for more business. Okay, so I would even challenge people to think about what does it mean every time you say, I don't have time. Every time you say you don't have time, you're saying you don't have space. You don't have room for more. Okay, you may be saying, you may deny, be saying no to something or denying something. The, I think the right way to answer is I choose to not make that important right now, right? So that you're prioritizing. But again, the energy of words, every time you say to yourself, I don't have enough time. I don't have enough time to get that done. Every time you say, I don't have enough, your brain is hearing, I don't have enough. And you're going to see more of that than what's going right. So I think there are assist, I, you know, I, as everything you can probably tell the way I approach is both a, a very logical and a very, um, you know, more experiential way to look at things. And I think that's part of being self-employed. I mean, being self-employed is not written in a manual somewhere. My book is the closest there will ever there has ever been to a manual for self-employed, and that's intentional. But the fact of the matter is, it's something we live and it's something we experience, right? So, how could we can talk about systems in the logical sense, but we also have to talk about systems in a way that it's more experiential, like the experience of being self-employed and striving to be bored is means you're opening up space for more business. And that's important. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That is important, right? We have to open ourselves up to more if we want to grow. If we want more, we have to stop saying we don't have enough and find ways to make the space, the margin, if we will, to be more of what we want. I love that, Jeffrey. That's super powerful. I think that's a great place here to start. But let's, for those folks that are just listening here at the end or thinking, oh, Let's tie that up in a bow. You talked about a lot of stuff today. Hug marketing. We talked about, uh, you know, the three different pillars there, personal development, business strategies, and daily habits. We talked a lot about energy, about so much systems and all this stuff. But Jeffrey, if folks were to get started, obviously they should go to your website. They should go and get a copy of The Self-Employed Life at theselfemployedlife.me. But how would they get started beyond just picking up a copy of your book? Yeah. So, and this is probably almost going to say, you said, you probably get a sense that I'm a very inward focused person. Like I said, I turned to personal development in order to my business strategy. And yet my answer to that question is going to be far more logical than you might expect is whatever your business idea is, it's got to be marketable. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, and I, I, to be honest, I think almost everything's marketable, but it, you have to be clear 
on whom you're building that for. And that's what makes it marketable. Um, when I start work with a client, what I'm always looking for is what is the intersection between what's meaningful to them and what's marketable in the world. What I will always be honest and discourage anybody if you you know if you have an idea, but I just don't see the marketability in it. That's like that's like setting somebody out on a course to keep running into a wall, and it's not fair. I will never do that as a business coach. I'd rather be honest and say. Maybe it's just that I'm not getting this idea for this business you want to build yet. Maybe I'm just not getting it, right? So I'll dig further, but I will always be honest and say, I just don't think it's what, the, and I like to use the frame, the framework of what does the world need, right? Because I will tell, if I had to say there was one secret to my success as a photographer and as a coach and all the, the 36 years of business, if I had to say there was one secret is I feel like I'm highly attuned to what the market needs, if not even a couple steps ahead. You know, I mean, as a photographer, I worked with the most affluent people in the country. And yet people I always thought were like way ahead of me. They certainly were way ahead of me financially. They were very evolved. Uh, and yet I always felt like I was a little ahead of them when it came to understanding the changes to come in their lives that they may not have seen yet, but that was going to impact my business. So I try to stay very highly attuned. That's why honestly, I manage crises very well. This, the pandemic lockdown, you know, I, I like to think of it as kind of being my third rodeo, having been through nine 11, the great recession. I even went into this crisis with even more, um, you know, more capacity and preparedness for it because I understand how they go. And I look at it and say, well, I can, I can get a sense of how the world is going to look differently at the end of all this. And I can help businesses be prepared for that difference. Because every time there's a crisis, the biggest, while so many procedures have changed in the world, the biggest change on the tail end of a crisis are people's values. That's always the biggest change. It was true after 9-11, true after the recession, when people's values shift Everything that they thought used to be important may not be important anymore. And what wasn't important to them a year ago is important to them now. That can have major impact on business and markets. So we must always ask ourselves, what does the world want now? And it may be that what you're currently doing may not have, can be pivoted to fit into that. Maybe there's a whole other business opportunity. You know, I mean, who would have thought what the world needed was hand sanitizer a year and a half ago, right? Who would have thought that would be like a best-selling item or toilet paper for that matter? I'm not sure. I'm still not sure I understood what that was all about. <laughs> but, you know, that's a fundamental question is what does the world want now? And that if you could be highly sensitive to that, you can see opportunities that may not be obvious, but you also can address what you may need to change in order to stay relevant combined, it's really answering the question of whether what your idea is or whether what you're doing is marketable. Because the only thing that's marketable is what the world needs. You can think awesome. you have the greatest, you can think you have the greatest widget in the world, but if the world doesn't see value in it, it's not going to sell. Yeah. Well, you said that right at the beginning there, the intersection of what's meaningful to you so that you can get energy from that, but also What's marketable in the world? What does the world need right now? And right now, I'd encourage folks to go get a copy of The Self-Employed Life. It's fantastic. You can get it at the theselfemployedlife.me. You can get to know Jeffrey there. You can go to jeffreyshaw.com and get to know Jeffrey. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't say, hey, listen to Jeffrey's podcast, The Self-Employed Life. It's fantastic. It's full of great interviews with smart, self-employed folks like him. So grateful for the time, Jeffrey, and thank you everyone for watching, for listening, and being part of our journey here towards the self-employed life. Thanks, Jeffrey. Good times, buddy. Thank you, Phil. I appreciate you. My pleasure.